This is Voluminous, a listening books podcast for every kind of reader, but especially for fans of audiobooks. I'm Jessica Stone, and for this last episode of the year, we're talking about that most Christmassy of authors, Charles Dickens, with writer, director, and actor Mark Evans, who so deftly parodied Dickens' work in Bleak Expectations, a BBC Radio 4 comedy series, which he also adapted as a novel and is now readying for the stage. Thank you for coming out to, uh, to see us today, Mark. It's a pleasure. I think that anyone who listens to Bleak Expectations can tell that there's real affection for the source material that's being spoofed. Um, but I understand that you weren't always necessarily a fan of Dickens' work. How did that change? Or can you tell me a bit about uh, that experience? My, so, yes, my relationship with Charles Dickens. What's interesting is that having written Bleak Expectations, people assume I really know my Dickens. Yes. And I... Should I just throw away all these questions that have do, assumed that? <laughs> I kind of don't. But I, I often find myself blessed. People go, uh, well, you know, it's Charles. Well, you'll know this, Mark. And I think, I probably won't. <laughs> um, and uh, I, well, I picked Bleak Expectations partly because I did finally get around to reading Great Expectations. Mm. And I did think that was an excellent book. I really, really enjoyed it. But my desire to pastiche or parody that era and that type of literature uh my came from more the idea that i want to do something that's in a slightly surreal world and the 19th century is pretty surreal anyway <laughs> in a in a world where we applauded the fact that children were no longer uh allowed to work 18 hours a day and was down to a minimum of 12 hours or a maximum of 12 hours ago well, that, that's just insane. So it's already slightly bonkers world, a slightly bonkers version of our world. Huge pat on the back for that. <laughs> yes, I know. Well done. Well, no, I mean, personally, my view is that children have much more energy and they kind of love helping. So uh, Why not take just, advantage of that? <laughs> yes, yes. Um, but uh, I thought that I'd like to do a slightly strange world. And I knew that with Dickens, it's sort of inbuilt into the syntax of being British. Because hmm. if someone said to you, uh, Charles Dickens, three adjectives. People go, oh, uh, uh, fog, poverty, uh, <laughs> Victorian London. You go, done. Um, those are nouns. <laughs> you're absolutely right. So, and fog, poverty, yeah, they, no, foggy. Okay, foggy, uh, poverty stricken. There you go. And Londony, <laughs> Victorian y Londony. Um, but, um, and I think it's, uh, I think there's a sort of inbuilt assumption that we all know what Dickens is because we all saw creaky. Uh, adaptations growing up mm. um, everyone sort of has a, a sense of what it is whether they've read it or not and that is tremendously useful if you're writing a comedy show because you don't have to build the world you can sort of say it is a Dickensian world and people go oh I've got that yeah and it's it seems like even if you haven't actually read the books or know exactly what's being referenced you recognize the references Anyway, yeah, and I think what's interesting is that loads of people um, have said, and uh, interesting, I've got a friend who's a professor uh, of English literature at Durham, hmm. and he's an expert on Victorian Handy. literature. <laughs> and uh, I quite often get texts off and going, ah, excellent, our mutual friend. And I text back, <laughs> is it? Well done, me. Not read it, mate. Um, uh, and I, I, my, my approach to writing was, I never wanted to write a joke that meant you had to know the Dickens to understand it, mm. um, because that's that's not fair. It's, you know, I wanted to write a big thing that everyone liked and and everyone could enjoy. And so there probably are references where if you get them, it in you know you, you can you know go well, I get that, but it doesn't matter because it sh still should be funny anyway. And what I did was with I, well, my history of Dickens is quite complicated. I first tried to read Charles Dickens when I was about nine or ten. <laughs> I had a copy, a Penguin classic of David Copperfield. And I kept trying. And I get to the end of the first page and go, oh, I can't read this. This is... I, what? I can't do this. I did the same thing. Only I did it with great expectations. Ah, OK. Um, and I think... Yeah, I was about um, eight or nine years old. And the thing was that the... 
there was a program at the time where you got a stamp for each book that you had completed where you could actually summarize what had happened. And if you got the card filled with stamps, then you got some sort of prize. I can't remember what it was. It might have been a book. I don't know. <laughs> a book. <laughs> yeah. Um, but I, ha I knew that Great Expectations was above you know, my age level. Yeah. So I bargained with the teacher that um, surely I should get two stamps oh, if I could read that book. I like this. <laughs> I know. What? But I, I mean, I can't remember if I Why actually finished it. Why aren't you running an investment it? bank? You've clearly got really sound. <laughs> but I definitely did not understand it. I just remember just, uh, I kept plowing through it. I was reading the words, but they just were not making sense to me. I, I couldn't fit the story together I at still all. do that with a lot of books these days. <laughs> And you, you do that for 10 pages, you go, maybe I'll stop this one. <laughs> um, no, but it's interesting. You try, I, I read, because I knew this was this great author, and there was a, was a copy, and I went, right, and try this. I just couldn't do it. And I, I don't think I read a Dickens until I was in my 20s when I read the Pickwick Papers. Yeah. And went, oh, this is, this is very entertaining. This is really funny. Um, and it stands up very well. And then a bit later, I read Great Expectations and went, oh, that really is a very, very good book. Um, I, I did really enjoy that. And then I read Bleak House and went, oh, that's great as well. Yeah. And all that sort of came into trying to do the same but silly. And then for each series, I tried to read a book to get myself into that world and see if I could get some inspiration for, from it. So I think the first series I read, I read David Copperfield. Yeah. And because of it, I ripped up a whole episode and did a new one because I was so incensed by the fact that Dickens in his sort of most autobiographical novel uh, casually has his wife dies so he can marry the woman he truly wants to be and so i just read that and went well Ooh. that's an episode <laughs> she doesn't seem to die of anything you know she dies of some sort of non-specific weakness i said to a friend i went oh right i'll do that i'll use that and i use that and so <laughs> that was the whole of one of the episodes um with him, with him marrying a wife who conveniently dies and it was interesting because i enjoyed copperville a bit but i found it quite annoying because it was autobiography mm. it's like he starts with whether i'm to be the hero of my own life or not is for someone else deciding you go mate you don't you don't <laughs> self-criticize at all you just wander through being kind of perfect and getting away with stuff it really annoyed me um and uh, and then i read another series i read our mutual i did read our mutual friend in the end particularly after my friend said you've nailed that so i didn't read it and i really enjoyed that i thought that was a very very good one uh i read oliver twist um i didn't like that one as much now that was one that that i expected to enjoy more than i yeah. did yeah yeah, there, there are no songs in it. That's, that's what's like surprised me. Uh, they, there's no exclamation mark at the end of the Oliver. I think it was baffling. And um, and contrary to what all my beliefs from having been in the play Oliver at school, Fagin gets hanged. Sorry to ruin it for everyone, but he does not go off with a jolly song. I find that very spoiler alert. He's shocking. I did something going seriously. He gets hanged. Um, and uh, uh, so I did start reading. You know the, the novels. I think I think I've done uh, about six or seven of them now. Was Nicholas Nickleby one of them? Uh, fun enough, I'm uh, partially through that at the moment. Ah. Um, I haven't done Nicholas Nickleby, and oddly, even though it's called Bleak Expectations and therefore Bleak House and Great Expectations, yeah. it's slightly more Nicholas Nickleby inspired. It, yeah. Well, I was uh, I was just trying to remind myself of the whole canon of Dickens' works yeah. prior, to, prior to this to remind my, to refresh my memory of characters because there are so many. And so I was reading the, the summaries and, and everything. And when I got to Nicholas Nickleby, I thought, actually, there's a lot of resemblance there yes, to I, Bleak I, Expectations. I once looked at the Wikipedia and it said, uh, the hard thrasher headmaster based on Wackford Squares. And I went, <laughs> it, that's, is that, who's that one from? Is that, is that Nicholas Nickleby? No, I haven't read that one. And it just, it, but then that sort of proves the point I was making that there's a there's a syntax of Dickens. Yes. And you can sort of get it. And oddly, I read Nicholas and went, wow, I really did get quite a bit of this without realising years ago when I first did it. But partly the inspiration for me is uh, for Pip. <laughs> it's Pip, named from Great Expectations, <laughs> is uh, the theatre poster of the RSC production of Nicholas Nickleby from uh, the 80s. And it's Roger Rees standing in front of the rest of the cast in their costume in a great wedge behind him. And him sort of standing there looking slightly noble and Victorian hero-like. And that is an image that always stuck in my head for writing Pip, that he should be this 
what he thinks of a noble hero who's yes. actually a bit of an idiot and as the series goes on <laughs> a little bit self-serving and yes well and actually i i put this down in my notes because i one of the delights for me in listening to the series is just right at the beginning how um sir philip bin or pip yeah. bin uh who is who seems to be both a parody of um, Dickensian characters like David Copperfield, but also of Dickens himself. Yeah, um, yes. Because, of course, David Copperfield, as you say, was sort of based on his own life and is a bit of an avatar for Dickens Yeah. anyway. Um, so you have Sir Philip Ben kind of full of self-importance uh, starting off on his grand tale. And it's just constantly being punctured and undermined by uh by mr sourquill the the journalist who's yeah. listening to his story interrupting him um with you know the changing of the cylinders for whatever oh, yes. yeah. invention he's 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 brought for the for the day and it's such a funny gag you you know it's coming um that each time he interrupts him and <laughs> <laughs> just punctures that self-importance just a little bit yeah it's so satisfying oh, it's great. so funny yeah um, uh, it's also partly because you know tony head and uh and R the late great richard johnson have such a brilliant rapport and their their comic yeah. timing is you know is extraordinary on that because i always thought well, i think that's funny i don't know if it'll play and then you hear it <laughs> and you go oh these people are good <laughs> oh they're superb yeah um but I think where I was going with that was that even though it does make fun of Dickens a little, I suspect that Dickens might actually appreciate it because he he also had uh, an eye for the absurd and the ridiculous. Yeah. Even in heroic characters, you know, even in say uh, Betsy Trotwood or whatever. They, yeah. You know, they're some of our favorite Dickensian characters. There's something of the ridiculous about them. Yeah. Even the even if there's an overall tone of overwhelming earnestness that's fun to mock yeah i mean a lot of that for me comes from comes from david copperfield because the mm. he's a bit earnest when you know it's based in his own life you go <laughs> come on charles get a grip mate um because and reading you know i've, I've read the claire tomalin biography which i mm. uh, which i thought was great um and reading up about him and you sort of go he did seem to be uh, in at times very warm open silly engaging man and at times quite pompous and yes um, which again is quite a Victorian thing, it seems like. And uh, maybe it's maybe it's the trousers and the and the waistcoats and the <laughs> and the frock coats that make you but you can't help but you, yeah. you think, Oh, I'm being all jolly and you put your long tailcoat on and you go, oh, I feel quite serious now. Like, <laughs> might might just be an entire thing down to Victorian couture. Um But I, I I do like sort of I, I do quite like breaking the pomposity of it and Yes. And it's it's a Philip being grumpy and <laughs> big and arrogant it's it's a you know nice you set up a nice target for him to be undercut by his idiot son-in-law which is quite fun yes doesn't and... in any way remind me of me and my father <laughs> um is there a trick or some sort of guiding rule of um making sure that no matter how ridiculous the character or the plot elements that it's still compelling enough for the audience to care what happens to them yeah, that, that's that. Yeah, that's an interesting question because it's quite. It's um, not long ago I was having a chat with a writer friend, and we were talking about naturalistic comedy and surreal comedy, and he was talking about that. He's saying, "Oh, you know, you get that sort of surreal comedy where you know there's a very carefully built world, um, and you know there are rules to it that uh, so there's you know it's its own particular rules, and you work within those parameters. And then there's stuff where people just make things up, like your show, like Bleak Expectations, Mark. And I got really <laughs> cross because I think that's wrong and i think he thinks i'm writing something glib and easily like that and actually it's got quite a it's it's very hard to explain but bleak Station has its own physics its own its own world and as long as i think as long as you set up the blocks of surreality within that carefully it sounds bonkers but you've got to have a logic to the illogical nature of it and uh again it helps having a victorian world which is slightly mad but recognisable. And obviously it helps as you go along and people get used to that world listening to it. So I think the, the later series are much madder than the first series, which is slightly grounded in the real literature. And then we have exploding volcanoes and trips to space and Harry Biscuit's brain ending up in a dinosaur and all that stuff that I don't think happened. I mean, I haven't read Barnaby Rudge, so that, <laughs> that, that, that might all happen in Barnaby Rudge. I don't know. Um, and I'm not going to read it because that will ruin my belief that that's what happens in Barnaby Rudge. <laughs> <laughs> But I think I think there is a logic to it, and I think as long as you, as long as the logic's there of the plot, 
then I think the characters can survive within that. And I think you, the characters are they're reasonably archetypical from from literature in general. You've got a, a hero, mm. and we undercut him and make him out not to be a hero at times. We have uh, he ha- and he has his best friend who's an idiot, mm. and they're basically but also sweet. Oh yeah, he's there's a, a yeah. sweetness. Harry yeah. is a lovely idiot, and he's a lovely idiot who sort of knows he's an idiot. Pip is a less lovely idiot who doesn't know he's an idiot yes. or doesn't think he's an idiot. And it turns out, that's it, game over, job done. Um, <laughs> and, I, and I think that, that really helps. And I think because Harry is lovely, it helps people like things. And also, you, you know, if, if Pip is a young man thrown into uh, the terrible school and told his father's being killed and he's got the evil Mr. Melvin always trying to get it, that's, 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 again, it's that archetypical plot thing. That works in a James Bond film or Die Hard as much as it works in Bleak Expectations. And oddly, as the series goes on, I do sort of think of them as kind of mini action films in where I go, well, this this time I'll go to, I'll take them to India. Let's see what happens there. Uh, and you think, well, I've got to come up with a big climax, so I'll have this. And you just build towards that. And hopefully no one got bored by the fact that every episode, <laughs> not every episode, <laughs> wasn't quite like that, but it was always like, oh, I've got an evil plan. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I've been thwarted. I, I know it was that, but in a slightly different way, hopefully. P.S. Ha, ha, ha. Yes. It's all that. Yeah. <laughs> Evil laughter. Um, Dickens was known to delight in performing his own work. Yeah. Uh, he had a special podium built for his readings. I don't know if you've been to the Dickens Museum in London. I have, yes. Yeah. They've mm. got, I don't know if it's the actual one that he had uh, created or if it's one modelled on that, but he wanted to be able to perform his readings and, and everybody be able to see, you know, the, the sort of full body performance yeah. of his characters. He really threw himself into it. Yeah. Um, I was just thinking, I imagine that that you, as someone who writes for performance and have performed some of your own work, might have some special insight into the <laughs> rewards of this, what, it, what it's like to either perform your own work or see it or hear it even performed well. Well, it's... it's- it's quite interesting. I've only, I, I've only done one reading of it. When I wrote, when I wrote a novelization, I did a reading at a literary event, and I, I really enjoyed that. That was great fun. Um, but you're right. Mostly, it was written for other people to perform. And although I did parts in it, bit parts, um, it was only ever small. And it, what's great about that is, I think, because I do have a performing background, so I don't think I do know how to write. Uh, it's not just a writer brain into making a joke work. It's it's the performing brain as well. And I will often be seen somewhere muttering to myself and I'm saying the line subconsciously often just to make sure it has that rhythm. Um, Is that while you're walking down the street and working out a scene in your head? Yeah, well, funny, yeah. I do. do that, that is, <laughs> yeah, I do. I do quite a lot of walking to to. You get stuck sometimes, and I like to take a walk. And you know, Charles Dickens did huge walks. Mm. I've never walked from Kent to London like he used to do, and things like that. Um, but quite long walks i've often been somewhere in the center of town and walked back to north london quite happily yeah um and i say it's to think and get over problems but actually it's just because that's a couple of hours you're not at your laptop typing (laughs) it's much more fun (laughs) look i'm in the open air i'm not with my laptop uh so yes a lot of walking but the performing thing is interesting because i do i love performing but equally i really like writing a show that great actors come into and i think you know i'm so blessed to have that cast they were all amazing. Absolutely everyone mm. um, was great. And they got the rhythm of it, got the pace of it, got the essential Victorian stupidity of it. <laughs> and it's lovely hearing people do things and hearing the great Richard Johnson do his best gravelly Shakespearean attack at something, but with ridiculous words done with gravitas, just makes you go, <laughs> wow, that's great. And... I, you know, I like to think it would work with pretty much anyone doing it, but to have a great cast do it was amazing. It just, it lifts it. It lifts it. And you find there are there are jokes that get bigger laughs because someone does it brilliantly. You know, it's what everyone says, writers say, oh, well, a great actor can add. And they really do. And then you gradually start adapting your writing for them. So uh, Tom Allen is amazing as Pip. You discover he has a great way of intoning things and slightly weirdly picking in a sort of, brilliant slightly more british slightly camper william shatner style way (laughs) and if tom ever hears this i mean that as an enormous compliment i have said this to him before and it means you can then write lines you think i reckon tom will do a special tom on this you don't tell him to but he does it and there's a there's a a moment uh, it's one of my favorite lines because he did it not because of the way i wrote it is when he's being captured and tortured but in his own house and 
Pippa and Ripley and Harry have not noticed he's in their house. They've all at times <laughs> gone in and seen him but thought it was a hallucination, just ignored him. And he's been tortured for months by Mr. Benevolent. And they come out and he goes, oh, and they say, it's been very hard, um, you know, with you away because it's been very difficult. And, he, and I just wrote the line, hard you know, or difficult for you, oh, because it's been so easy for me. And Tom made that last about a minute and a half again because it's been so easy <laughs> for me. And he just, it, it just, he got about nine laughs out of it, and it was extraordinary. And it was a, it was an act of acting genius. And every single cast member had moments like that. Mm. And sometimes I could add to that by writing. I thought, I reckon they can do their special trick on that. <laughs> Uh, but it's brilliant. It's lovely writing for those great performers, and it's lovely performing it myself uh, when I, you know, when I had the chance to read it out or doing the bits I did in it. Yeah. Did uh, you ever uh, write any characters particularly for yourself? Yes. And then yeah. Gareth, my lovely producer, always saying, well, "That's quite a nice part. I think we can get someone famous into the." Earth. So <laughs> I wrote the Reverend Ripley Feck. Uh, no, the Reverend uh, what, Godly Feck and Ripley's father. I wrote that thing. I'll play that. I'll play that. I'll be a returning cameo for me. <laughs> and Gareth went, that's a nice part. Should we ask David Mitchell to do it? It's like, oh, <laughs> all right, let's get David in. David is a lovely man. He did it very, very well. And that was great. But every time I did that, we managed to get a guest star. It's like, yeah. So I sort of had in my head a formula of, if a part has fewer than five lines, I might be allowed to do it. Aww. Uh, <laughs> What, what, you want Harrison Ford to do these three lines as a horse? Fine. <laughs> he pulled out on the day. That's why I play Hector the Holy Horse in <laughs> one of the episodes of the last series, which is mostly going... That's <laughs> 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 my horse impression. OK, so by contrast then, when you wrote the novel version, yeah. what was that like then, suddenly reading for... Or, or sorry, writing for a solitary reading experience rather than for performance? It was, uh, what's interesting is because it's written in Sir Philip's voice and written in the first person, I found it not dissimilar to writing the Sir Philip stuff in the radio show. And I would quite often hear Richard, Richard Johnson's voice yeah. in it. And that was, that was great. Oddly, writing that um, made me think, you know, at some point I'd really like to do Bleak Expectations, The Missing Years and do a sort of one person show. Uh, with me doing all the different parts or you know doing it as a philip as a as a dickensian style yeah. thing i think it'd be really fun to do that um and i don't think anyone let me so i have to do it myself um and that's a bit further down the line somewhere but i really would really love to do that uh partly because i've been looking at the book again recently and yeah you're uh, adapting it for a stage uh, i am actually version, yes right? um uh, i was approached by i've always wanted to do it for stage from quite early on because i thought it would be a good idea <laughs> as simple as that <laughs> and I think it'd be really fun um, and it obviously works in front of a live audience people like the jokes and so I am actually adapting it I have adapted it and I'm about to do a read through for a potential production that we hope to get on mm. over the next six to twelve months and that again is very interesting I mean looking at the different iterations of it in the book which is slightly more there's more in the book than in the radio show because there are more words <laughs> you can shove them in um and i've had to sort of com i've taken the first series essentially and made it into the stage show but i've changed quite a bit to condense it down into uh two hours rather than the three hours a series run at so it's quite different again there's a lot that's very familiar and there's a quite a bit that's different and that's been really interesting trying to get some of my favorite stuff in and being a big grown-up writer now, I look at it sometimes and go, oh, that's really good. I really like all this stuff. I'm, yeah, mm, that doesn't work with the plot, does it? Oh, it really doesn't work. Oh, this is one of my favourite bits. Oh, it's just got to go. I've got to be a big grown-up now. Select those three pages, delete them Oof. Uh, to make it all fit, um, which has been hard, but it's you know it meant I've come up with some interesting new stuff that I hope mm. hope works quite well. Um, although I find myself occasionally writing lines, I think, I've come with a new line! <laughs> And I was like, I wrote it six years ago and I'd just forgotten. <laughs> but it's all sort of in the hard drive of my brain ready to come out. It's probably a good sign when there are lots of real gems on the cutting room floor because it means if you've, if you've cut stuff that's that good, that what remains really must be... I hope so. And, I, you know, you say the gems on the cutting room floor, they might be, it might be fool's gold and... Uh... <laughs> Might just be rubbish, but uh, when, you, when you're chopping stuff out that you know is good and works because it doesn't quite fit with the plot, then I think I think that puts you in a, a relatively healthy situation. And I'd, I'd hope the play works really well, and I'm going to do it with a narrator, 
I think, and have Sir Philip there on an armchair mm. um, and have the cast running around madly. And we'll have a lot of doubling <laughs> up and changing costumes and uh, try and do some extraordinary theatrical things that you won't believe. I've written in a... This might not last beyond the read-through, but I've written in uh, a... Uh, <laughs> A fight between a real sword and a sword that's been baked out of sourdough. So, and I've written it gets <laughs> chopped into delicious slices through the sword <laughs> fight. And I sat back and went, mm, that probably isn't going to happen, but it's funny. <laughs> I'll stick that in. So this um, this strikes me as one of the things that's probably easier to execute as um, as a radio production. Mm. Um, that sort of joke, because trying to get yes. that visual gag to actually just just the logistics of yeah. getting that to happen i think so and i think interestingly i think there's a there's a sort of hierarchy of how easy it is to get jokes w- to work and i mm. think it goes from radio is within reason the easiest because it's from the speaker into the ear into the brain stage shows are the next easiest because it's, it's more live in the media and i think tv is the hardest and i mm. think TV comedy is very hard, but if there are big jokes and big visual jokes. I was talking to friends who've written a show called Zapped, which is in its third series on Dave. I'm plugging my friend's shows here. And that's excellent. But I had a long chat to them uh, about, and they said, we've got this joke, and which way do we play it visually? How do we do it in the edit? Do we do it this beat, this beat, this beat? Or do we switch them around? And you go, gosh, that really is an interesting question. And on radio, you can do it. You just you sort of imply it's happened on stage. Physics takes care of it. it involved dropping something on someone. So physics really comes into its own. Mm. But how do you show the audience on TV? You have to choose. You have to be someone's brain, a putative watcher's brain and go, I think they would like to see this, then this, then that. And that'll put it home. Mm. And it's very, very hard. And I think I've worked quite a bit in TV I have never worked with anyone on TV who I haven't thought was brilliant at their job. It's a, you know, the, the skills people bring to it are amazing from, you know, everyone. From the person who's, you know, on their first job running and making you coffee, they're generally brilliant at that, to the director of our, all the people who make props and costumes, do the makeup, they're all brilliant. And yet, you know sometimes that comedy just doesn't quite work on TV because it's really, really hard, it turns out. Uh, so I think that's at the, that, the, the hierarchy puts that, that's a really tricky skill. Um, Is that why it was suggested that bleak expectations would be better for radio than for television initially? Um, I think it, initially, yes. Yeah. I mean, it's radio is great, and I know it's it's very trite to say, but it is because you can go anywhere for the same amount of money. And I think that's um, I think it I think it's a Stephen Fry, the great Stephen Fry, said one of the most expensive lines you can write as a screenwriter is exterior space the fleets collide. <laughs> <laughs> You've just spent millions of dollars there in one line. Um, and, of course, you do that on the radio. Radio, you just put, you know, Atmos. <laughs> atmosphere is, uh, well, no atmosphere, it's space. Uh, the sound of, of laser guns and fighting. Job done. You've done Star Wars for 20 pence, renting a CD. Um, and that, that does make it easy. Now, that's, that's, not, that's also an amazing skill in itself to get that atmosphere and to get the right sound effects and... I loved working with people who did the sound effects on to write them in and go, right, um, right, Jill Abraham, let's see how you tackle this one. You know, a cybernetic donkey falling into custard or whatever it was. It's it's great. And you hear stuff and you just go, wow, they've really done that amazingly. You know, the sound the sound and production team were just as good as the actors. It's, it, it's great. Um, but it, there is a sort of directness to radio, I think, and the fact you can conjure up stuff with a sound and... Like I mentioned before, we've had we've had volcanoes, we've had everyone in space. It's it's cheap and easy, and I know that sounds really it's such a banal cliche, but it's true, and that's why radio is amazing. It can take you all sorts of places, and it's why, for example, you know, everyone one of the greatest radio shows ever, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, extraordinary yes. production values, took you to a different world. They did it on TV, and admittedly, it's in the eighties where special effects were developed, and I still I still enjoyed that. I still think it's a really interesting piece of work at night, but it, it's not as directly special not as directly unique and amazing because your your mind isn't filling in the gaps it's filled in for you by a camera and someone's had to make that decision on behalf of everyone listening uh, everyone watching rather whereas on radio everyone gets to make their own world up so if you've got i'd love to get an audience and you say right now we just played you that scene of mr malevolent doing this bit draw where you think it's happening (laughs) and everyone will have a different image of it i think um, I think that'd be a fun experiment. Yeah, well, I have it. I have a very strong image of where everything's happening. Oddly, when I when I used to, when I wrote it, I always know where everyone was and what the room looked like. Really? Yeah, it's quite weird that. 
Um, and I remember having the odd discussion with Gareth would go, well, can't you do this? Went, no, 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 because uh, Pip's on the other side of the room and he's hidden behind and they go, but it's Radium Up. Yes, you're right. <laughs> yes, no, that's just in my head. That's just how it's, yeah, sorry. I've just imagined it so precisely. That's so interesting. I think... Um... I think it's similar when uh, with readers that some readers, when they're reading a book, can picture everything very, very precisely, mm. which is why then seeing an adaptation can be so disappointing if it doesn't match up exactly yes. to what they were picturing. Yes. Um, and for some reason, although I think that I have a fairly vivid imagination, it doesn't seem to be particularly visual. I don't know. Right. I, you know, there's no, there's no distinct picture that I'm comparing. So you're not, you're not sort of living the book as you read it in your imagination you haven't sort of got well i am a peripheral but vision of a, of a of a scene with the colors and the costumes and everything you don't have that if or... i have any kind of visual of it it's a uh, sort of van gogh style it's 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 a it's it's not distinct it's yeah. it's a bit blurry around the edges but I, I do feel like i'm living it it's just that i'm living the the feelings of it right rather than oh, that's interesting the visual of yeah. it i think oh i wonder if that verges into the sort of synesthesia of uh, do you get do you get that you know where you get you I've heard of, of it I don't know if I've uh, experienced it but um, you get that sometimes that oh, I used to annoy, I used to write with someone I used to write with James who plays Harry Biscuit many years ago <laughs> and I would annoy him sometimes by he'd say I'd say I'm not sure this is right and he'd go well it's, it's fine I went oh no it's kind of oh no it feels too blue for me and it needs to be more purple <laughs> he'd go what are you on about <laughs> I can't explain, but... That's a helpful note. Thank you. Yes, I know. And it's the wrong shape. You know, what do you mean it's the wrong... Well, this feels like a cube with lumps on it. And that, we don't write together anymore. Um, <laughs> for that reason. Well, I think it's very interesting how people uh, visualise stuff. And, and you're right, that idea that someone has an adaptation, you watch an adaptation, you go, that's not how I imagined it. Mm. And I find if I revisit the book that so I read when I was younger... And it's quite interesting. It's like my brain reboots the images that I imagined back then. Oh. So I can pick up something I haven't read for 25 years and I'll read. I go, well, I'm feeling weirdly nostalgic. And ah, it's because I'm imagining it exactly the same way. Yeah. Which might be a sign that I've not developed in any <laughs> way as a human being no. intellectually. Or just that I have a strong memory for how I felt while reading that book. And that helps. Yeah. No, I, I had something like that with uh, The Lord of the Rings, which I, I read uh, so many times when I was a kid. Right. And I was reading my uncle's uh, 1960s uh, version, uh, pu publication of it. Yeah. Um, and I think for a birthday, my parents gave, or not a birthday, for Christmas. This is vitally important that we get this right. <laughs> yes, it has to be exactly the right occasion. <laughs> yes. Uh, anyway, they gave me one of these, you know, really beautiful kind of um, gilt edged books that was sort of leather bound yeah. and whatever. And I tried reading it and it just. I just couldn't get into it with those slick pages Doesn't and everything. Feel the same. No, it had to be that tattered 1960s. Yeah. Uh, I slightly get upset it. when I want to get a book that I haven't got anymore. And they go, oh, they've changed. I mean, of course they've changed the edition. You know, <laughs> it's not the same cover. And you think, oh, should I spend ages looking for it on. Uh... Just get over it. But it does bother you sometimes. Yeah. You know, it's, just not, it's not quite right anymore. <laughs> it's not quite right. Um, I, th I think that, that the idea of imagining things, and I imagine people do imagine the the radio world. I never really thought about it. Maybe we just listen to the words, but I imagine they've got a world in their head conjured up. Um, I don't know. Gosh, that's really... Oh, different people thinking in different ways. It's never occurred to me before. <laughs> <laughs> well, I do think, um, as you were saying, that that we all kind of share a... Well, certainly the British share a syntax of Dickens. Yeah. Um, but I think because of all the different adaptations as well, I think we all, British or not, kind of have share a similar visual of of what a Dickensian world looks like. Yes. Um, I think there's no other writer really so closely associated with Christmas as mm. as Dickens. I mean, even programs that ostensibly don't really have anything to do with Dickens at all are often sort of set in the Victorian, uh, kind of a Dickensian look anyway, around yeah. Christmas time. Um Obviously, A Christmas Carol has has a lot to do with that, with our associations with Dickens and Christmas. But I wonder, is there is there anything more to why that's that feels so appropriate to us for the holidays? I think it's it must. I think it must be connected to the fact that I'm going to repeat myself slightly, but the idea that our modern world is our modern world was sort of founded in the 19th century. So many of the institutions and the rule of law and so many things were the. Directly linked. It's I think the 19th century is much more directly linked to 
today than the 17th century is linked to the 19th century. I think they're, they're very different to my mind. I'm, you know, I'm obviously wrong and get some historian coming and hitting me on the head with a large book saying, read my book and you'll understand why you're wrong. But <laughs> And you can add it to the 63 books that you've got piled up. I have a huge number of books by my bed. <laughs> We're going to um, get to that. <laughs> um, and all, part of that is our concept of Christmas, which, of course, was brought over slightly from Germany by uh, Victoria and Albert. That's right. And yeah. so bringing the, 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 the Christmas tree, uh, O Tannenbaum and all that, and, and all the decorations. Which I, I, I'm not great on this, but that did... I think that really culturally established Christmas as a big thing in Victorian yeah, England I and, think and the rich been... feasting and stuff that we we did have, but not all together. I, I had read that, that Christmas, celebrating Christmas, had been kind of on the decline prior yeah. to that, that, that was, it was kind of brought back by Victorian Albert and Dickens, yeah. who loved it. Yes, and I think, I, yeah. I think that's it. I think he became like the propaganda for it. That Christmas yeah. Carol is like the propaganda leaflet for you know, <laughs> new, all Anglo-German Christmas or British-German <laughs> Christmas. And I think because of that, uh, now we automatically associate Dickens with, with Christmas. Um, and because Christmas Carol has been adapted so many times and because it seems that everyone must have seen it or been aware of it in some way. Um, there are so many different adaptations of it. And so it's so in the consciousness, and it is usually adapted in the 19th century. Obviously, you've got the brilliant Bill Murray in Scrooge, yeah. which is not. It's set in New York in the 1980s, <laughs> 90s. Um, and I think it's all that. It's that combination of the, the royal family bringing their German Christmas thing, the royal family being an uh, object of adulation, say, oh, look, Queen Victoria has a Christmas tree. We'll get a Christmas tree. We'll all do that. All we're all starting to develop a bit of a, you know, a, a middle class from the Industrial Revolution, and even the working class has got a bit of money now. We'll let them have an hour and a half off on Christmas Day. <laughs> uh, they, they were eventually allowed off on Christmas Day. Obviously not Bob Cratchit because that would ruin a, a Christmas Carol. Um, and so there's a little bit of time, a little bit of money. People can start spending on it and doing that, and that is the start of our modern Christmas. It's a time off. It's a time to indulge. And I'm sure that's why it's all connected back to Dickens. And because Christmas Carol is such a... It is an amazing story. I've never read it. Uh, but I have seen many adaptations. And my aunt was an extra in the adaptation with George C. Scott as Scrooge. Oh. Filmed in Shrewsbury in the 80s, I think. Um, Very good. And we're all so aware of it. And I think, again, I think it sort of fuels back. It's like a feedback loop, isn't it? Of That's part of our imagination of what Victorian Britain was like. It's like a Christmas Carol. Yeah. It wasn't snowy all the time, you know, <laughs> but I bet there are people listening going, oh, I always sort of sort of assumed it was. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, you know, now if someone has, says, oh, yeah, we're having a goose for Christmas, I don't know, but I automatically go, Dickens. Right. <laughs> Dickensian. You're having a goose? That's Dickensian. That's bonkers. Why are you having a goose? But it does feel yeah. that sort of large Dickensian thing. I also think, I mean, even aside from A Christmas Carol, which, I mean, all by itself as you say, did a lot to yeah. sort of evangelize for Christmas. <laughs> yes. Um, but even aside from that, I think even the other uh, Dickens books, because they so often have to do, the sort of the moral of the story so often has to do with the generosity of spirit. Yeah. His his stories just kind of seem fitting for a season that is supposed to remind us of what's meant to be important to us. Yeah. Yeah, and I, I wonder. Christmas Carol is—it's a supernatural book. It's got—it's got ghosts and it's creepy. And, actually, you know, Grace Expectations doesn't. The other books don't. And it, yeah. yes, it is quite creepy and quite scary. It's a huge moral mallet smacking down on yes. Scrooge's head <laughs> in ghost form. Yeah, it's um, not known for its subtlety, actually. <laughs> but that—but that—that that exaggeration of it, I think, does mm. bring out those morals that are there and the, the idea of good triumphing over evil and the, the, mm. the generosity of spirit that are in the other books uh, to a greater or lesser extent. Uh, but by putting them through that supernatural, slightly surreal, exaggerated way, I think that, that hits the brain a bit harder, doesn't it? But yes, but those yeah. those themes are echoed in his other books, but in a more gritty, realistic way with a lot more, many more orphans dying and street sweepers spending five or six pages croaking. I intend this Christmas anyway mm -hmm. to uh, to finish the rest of Bleak Expectations because I want to get to the bit in series five mm. When Mr. Ben Gently Benevolent has an, e an evil advent calendar. <laughs> yes, he has an advent calendar of evil. Yes. An advent calendar of evil. That's it. Um, so I'm, my, my goal is to get to that. But I was thinking I might also listen to uh, Nicholas Nickleby because I think mm. that's one of those that I may not have actually read that just seems familiar yeah. because all of Dickens seems familiar. But 
I wondered if I could be very cheeky and ask you, just as a Christmas treat for all of us, if you might read a passage that I have selected and abridged of Charles Dickens' A Christmas Carol. You took the words out that he shouldn't have put in. You edited him. <laughs> yes. You say you say abridged. You, you did the have... second draft he couldn't be bothered with. <laughs> I abridged for time's sake, but I selected this passage partly because it starts off um, with one of the things that I think you lampoon so well in Bleak Expectations, which is when his descriptions just get so extra. <laughs> like, <laughs> That's a very good way of putting it. They get extra, yes. Yeah, yeah. You just think, really? <laughs> now with added words. Exactly. Yeah. Um, so if you wouldn't mind giving us all uh, yeah. a little Christmas story. There. I shall use my reading voice. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's not it, sorry. I just couldn't resist. Oh dear, here we go. Oh, but he was a tight-fisted hand at the grindstone Scrooge. A squeezing, wrenching, grasping, scraping, clutching, covetous old sinner. Hard and sharp as flint from which no steel had ever struck out generous fire, secret and self-contained, and solitary as an oyster. The cold within him froze his old features, nipped his pointed nose, shriveled his cheek, stiffened his gait, made his eyes red, his thin lips blue, and spoke out shrewdly in his grating voice. A frosty rhyme was on his head, and on his eyebrows, and his wiry chin. He carried his own low temperature always about with him. He iced his office in the dog days, and didn't thaw it one degree at Christmas. A Merry Christmas, Uncle! God save you! cried a cheerful voice. It was the voice of Scrooge's nephew, who came upon him so quickly that this was the first intimation he had of his approach. Bah! said Scrooge. Humbug! He had so heated himself with rapid walking in the fog and frost, this nephew of Scrooge's, that he was all in a glow. His face was ruddy and handsome, his eyes sparkled, and his breath smoked again. Christmas a humbug, Uncle! said Scrooge's nephew. You don't mean that, I am sure. I do, said Scrooge. Merry Christmas. What right have you to be merry? What reason have you to be merry? You're poor enough. Come then, returned the nephew gaily. What right have you to be dismal? What reason have you to be morose? You're rich enough. Scrooge, having no better answer ready on the spur of the moment, said, Bah! again, and followed it up with, Humbug! <laughs> it is a bit purple, isn't it? <laughs> That's a that's a lot of lot of lot of uh, verbs in the early sentence. Oh yeah, yeah. It's part of the fun, though. It I is. Mean, it's it great, just... isn't it? <laughs> but it flows so well. It's so it does conjure up an image. It's great. It does, yeah. Well, thank you well, so much that for right. that treat. That was wonderful, um, and I've really enjoyed the conversation. Um, I, I have also enjoyed it very much, and we hope you enjoyed it very much too. Keep an eye out for the stage production of Bleak Expectations. And if you haven't already, go find the radio series. It's exactly the sort of thing the whole family can appreciate together over the holidays. And if you're a member of Listening Books, you won't have to look hard as it's available in the Listening Books library. This is technically the last episode of this limited series of Illuminous, but you may want to stay subscribed as I've heard rumors of a New Year's bonus. Plus, you'll want to know if and when a new series begins. Voluminous is produced by Listening Books, a UK charity providing audiobooks for people who have difficulty reading print, whether that's because of illness, disability, learning, or mental health. If that's you or someone you know, you can find out how to access our more than 7,500 titles, including Mark Evans' Bleak Expectations and lots of Dickens by heading to listening-books.org.uk. Only one more thing to say. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas, everyone. <laughs> right, let's go and feast on goose. <laughs> <laughs>